What a fun show this is, right? Am I right? This is a great show. Charlie Talk is next, ladies and gentlemen. I was watching Frontline about uh, six weeks ago. Frontline on PBS. And there was a show on Wall Street. What was the name of the show, Charlie? It was like Wolves of Wall Street or something like that. It was something. To Catch a Traitor. And I'm watching the show, and I love Frontline. It's great PBS documentary filmmaking. And they're interviewing all these Wall Street guys, and it's a lot of boring guys in suits, and they're like, um, we, you know, there were, there were bonds to be traded, and uh, you know, there's a lot of dry stuff. But there's one guy, and he's kind of sitting, it's like, he's making me laugh. There's one Wall Street guy, and he's telling stories about the trading days, and the garage, Raj and all these guys who went down. And I'm loving the guy. It's like one in the morning, and it's just me having a Pilsner and Kel watching TV, and I'm like, who is this guy? And his name pops on the screen. Attorney Duff. So I said, this is why I'm living in 2014. I'm going to find the guy. So I look him up online. It's easy. There's only one Attorney Duff out there. He's monopolizing the Google search on Attorney Duff. And I immediately email him. I'm like, dude, I'm watching you on Frontline. I want you to come to my show. And the next day he emails me. He's like, I'll do it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Attorney Duff. I have to 
see it, and Sydney uh, filmed Michael having sex with a hooker, and then she mailed the videotape to Jane. And she's like, shut up! <laughs> So, you know, needless to say, 24 hours later, I get a job off of Morgan Sale. And, um, you know, here I am, I'm a 24-year-old kid from a small town of Maine, and I know nothing about nothing. And I'm here in New York City, um, just trying to trying to figure it out and navigate my way. And, you know, so I get this great, great advice from a guy from Maine who tells me, he's like, look, when you go out to New York City, this is what you have to do. He's like, you know, put money, you know, in this pocket, put money in this pocket in this pocket, in this pocket. And so if you do get mugged, then you know you can just say, oh, you know, here's, here's my money, and then you still have the three other pockets. But the, the problem was, when it got real late in the, in the evening, and you know, it was my turn to buy drinks again, you know, I would order you know, six Budweiser's, and, and you know, the bartender would say, you know, that's $25 or whatever. And I'd be like, hold on a second. And I, you know, go for the 20 that's in the sock. And, uh, you know, it, uh, I, I definitely was a little terrified of New York City, you know, early on. And, you know, I was walking home from work, it's my first year, walking home from work, and I'm standing at the corner of 57th and Broadway. And I'm holding all of these papers, coming home from Morgan Stanley, and this 60 year old, uh, she looks like she's coming from church, and she, she's kind of looking at me. And so I'm just, Kind of smiling and you know looking back at her, and she's she's like, you look you look like you do a lot of work. And I kind of look down at the paper, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I work pretty hard. And she says to me, she's like, well, she's like, maybe you you should go over to my apartment. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, I'm like, oh, what do you what do you do in your apartment? And she goes, this woman's six years old. She goes, you know, massage. I literally take off an Olympic sprint across Broadway. I mean, I was terrified. I was like, I, I did not know. And the thing is, to this day, this is 20 years later, anyone says the word massage to me, the only thing I hear is, no. <laughs> like, so my mom can say, yeah, we went down to Mexico and I got, you know, we, me and your dad got a massage. I'm like, no. <laughs> like, I can't get it out of my head. So, um, here I am, Morgan Stanley. I have, I have no business being there. You know, I got a guy to the right of me who went to Harvard. I got a woman to the left who went to Duke. And I just have no business being at Morgan Stanley. And so, you know, during the day, I was out experience, out connected, out degree, and I just, there was nothing I could do. And so, what I quickly kind of learned was that when the office lights went out and the city lights went on, I actually stood a chance. So I could crush the guy from Harvard at happy hour. I could crush the girl from Duke at happy hour. And, <coughs> and, and I figured out that, okay, my position is I'm the fun guy. And so people Morgan Stanley would not come up to my desk and say, you know, Tony, what stock should I buy? They would come up to my desk and say, hey, my wife's out of town. Which bar should I take my girlfriend to? And so I was okay with that. And, and I sort of was able to navigate my way up through Morgan Stanley as as the party guy, and as the guy that you wanted to, to hang out with after work. And so, as things progressed, um, I still didn't know what I was doing, but I got an opportunity at a, at a hedge fund called the Galileo Group. Um, and um, as, as things sort of progressed, I slowly started to figure out how things worked on Wall Street. And now that I was on the buy side, everything changed. and. My, you know, my social life changed and, and the way people treated me because I was the client on Wall Street. Everyone wanted a piece of my business. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the party guy and, you know, it's a perfect, perfect position for me. And so I'm doing it for about a year or two and I'm out to, uh, for drinks one night, <coughs> excuse me, with this guy called Louis the Shoe. And he's this big, huge Italian guy from New Jersey. Um, probably wore one of those foreign Italian horn things, hairy chest. And so I'm, I'm standing next to him and he likes bumping my hand like he wants to play one potato, two potato. So I reach out my hand and he puts this giant bag of white powder in my hand. And I'm just like, oh, okay. So I put it in my pocket and I'm hanging out and I'm not sure what to do. And you know, after about five minutes, he says to me, he's like, you gonna go to the bathroom and hit that or what? So I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm gonna go hit it. So I go to the bathroom. And the only thing I 
really knew about cocaine was um, that Led by a guy in 1986 from doing it once, and that Don Johnson could knock down your door and you know blast a few bullet holes into you. And so I'm looking at this bag, and I don't know, that, do I pour the whole thing into the toilet? Do I do, I do a little of it? Or, like, I had no idea. So I, I thought I was supposed to do the whole thing. And I'm looking at it, and, and I, I'm, I'm terrified of it. So I put it back in my pocket, I go back out to the bar, and I lose the shoe, and about 10 minutes later, she's like, dude, you have my fucking coat? And so I was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I give it to him, you know, and you know, I toss that bullet. So six months later, um, a lot had changed. My bank account had changed. I was running with a fast crowd. Um, I had I had been promoted at work, and everything was kind of clicking the right way. And so it was offered to me again. And this time, I was like, Yeah, I'm like, Yeah, it seems right. You know, like this is this is what I'm supposed to do. And and I have to tell you, I don't know how many of you have done cocaine, but um, to me, it was the greatest, greatest feeling of, 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 of all time. It was like that moment right before you're about to come, but it was for an hour. And and as I went from the bathroom back up to the, to the roof of the uh, Thompson Hotel, I actually said to myself, I'm like, this is so good, it's going to be a problem. I, I didn't know when, but at some point, this is going to be a problem because it is so good. And I always sort of had this void that I've been trying to fill. I always just wanted more, uh, no matter what it was. Um, you know, and, and the best way I can describe it is, you know, if someone talks about um, cloud nine, you know, my brain goes to, there must be a cloud 10 with a VIP section, and that's where I want to be. Or with Spinal Tap, when they talk about this goes to 11. Like, that makes total sense to me. And uh, so, as, as I started to do more and more cocaine, I became more and more obsessed, and I loved it. It was just the greatest feeling of my entire life. And so, as things, it's interesting because my career actually, the more cocaine and more alcohol that I did, the more successful I became. And it, it, was, it was sort of very strange, but um, that's, that's how it works on Wall Street for a while. And, you know, I get to the top of the mountain, I get the girl, um, I have the apartment, I, I buy a house, um, I've got the bank account, I have the social scene, and I'm still sort of kind of, kind of empty. And, and I don't know what's going to fill this void anymore. Um, so I continue to do more and more and more and more. And it's, it's to the point where I can't stop. Um, I'm probably going to go game five or six times a week. I'm drinking every night. And, you know, my girlfriend's pregnant. And I'm saying to myself, okay, she's pregnant. I, I got to be responsible. Um, this, is, this is the sign from God I'm going to quit. And so by the second trimester, I was out at it again. I was much, much worse and to the point where you know the day my daughter was born I said okay this this is it and three days after my daughter was born I was in this sort of Wall Street crack house that we call the White House and I just I could not stop so um you know it's interesting because I used to actually think that uh, a post-it note could could stop me from using cocaine because what I would do at nine o'clock is I would write probably about 300 post-it notes, and it would say, "Must shut down at midnight." You know, you have to work tomorrow. You you have a daughter, all over the apartment. And my plan was that I would stop at midnight, and I would go to bed and, and, and make it to work the next day. And so, literally after the first line, I'm running around the apartment, pulling on all these post-it notes, throwing them out, and I just could not stop. And I didn't want to stop. I wanted to control it, and, and it never, ever, ever happened. And so, um, as, as as you can imagine, you know things went from bad to worse. And uh, in 2006, um, I had the bird flu. I had the West Nile virus. Um, I had the SARS virus. I had a pink eye. I had a flood in my apartment. I had a friend who tried to commit suicide. I mean, you name it, I had it. And I was calling it sick at least once a week. And it's amazing. It's amazing that I still had a job. But um, so, you know, things things had gotten so bad that my boss basically said, is if you fall in sick one more time, you know, you're, you're fine. And of course, I decided I was going to just party just a little bit and then, you know, I'll stop at 7 o'clock and I'll make it to work the next day. And so I went all the way through. I managed to get through work that day. I went all the way through again, got through work. 
So now I'm on day three of a I have not slept, and I'm continuing to do cocaine. And so I have a cab take me up to 54th Park Avenue. Um, and it drops me off, it's about 5 a.m. Um, it had rained the night before, and there was scaffolding on, on, on the building, and it was sort of that sort of post-apocalyptic feel to the, to the city. It was as if I was the only one alive, um, and barely. And so I knew that if I showed up for work, I was going to be fired. If I called in sick, I was going to be fired. And so I did not know what to do. And I'm, I'm circling the block, circling the block, chain smoking cigarettes, and I see this puddle that had formed the night before. And so I'm looking at it, and I'm like, so I, I kind of take a step, and I run, and, and I kind of try to throw myself into this puddle. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried to fall. It's actually really, really, really fall. Um, so I, I pick myself up, and I'm past that one little tiny scrape of my, my palm, and I'm like, all right. And so I throw myself back in this puddle, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. and I'm like, I get up, and I'm limping, and my pants are so they're ripped. My, my shirt, I'm bleeding on my elbow. And uh, so I get up and I'm like, oh, I'm losing. And I run back into the puddle. I'm just like slamming my head and I'm slamming my arms. And I'm just, I'm trying to beat the shit out of myself. And so I get up and I'm bleeding all over. My, everything is ruined. And I'm, I'm just like scared. And, and I'm living into where I work. And uh, so I, I walk in and it's this hedge fund. And, you know, they, they kind of, they definitely knew what was going on, but I walk in there and, and I can barely speak because I've been doing cocaine for three days. And, and I look at my boss and I just say, I, I was smoked. And I turn around and I just limped out of, out of the office. And so, that was October 2006, so that was the one time that I was involved. And that's the one person that I actually loved. Um, but uh, you know, needless to say, 48 hours later, I was on the plane off to my first drug and alcohol rehab. Um, and as, as you can imagine, um, it, didn't, it didn't go as smoothly as I, as I hoped. And I, I struggled for a while, 2007, 2008. And I, I, I had this brilliant, brilliant idea um, in 2008. I knew I was a drug addict and alcohol. And I knew that I couldn't have one drink. I couldn't have a line of cocaine. And so I said, why not one relapse? And, and that set me off for another two years. Went back to drug and alcohol rehab. But uh, you know, proudly on uh, October 16th, I'll have five years sober. Uh, so, uh, I want to thank Tom for asking me to speak. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Very, very grateful to, to have this opportunity. Um, the next guy who's coming up, you know, a little small fun fact, um, spent a week on my couch in 2002. So um, I'm very interested to, uh, to see what Ben has to say. So thank you very much. Ben. Thank you. 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 Thank you.